Is it true that Alzheimer's is the third leading cause of death? Are there any drugs or medical procedures that reverse it? Uh, it is true, and this is something that Professor Christine Yaffe showed several years ago, and her team uh, showed that if you look at serial autopsies, it is actually the third leading. It's often said to be the sixth leading cause of death. One way or another, it's very common. Uh, but here, to put it in perspective, uh, we talk often about the pandemic, and of course, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19 um, has killed over 400,000 Americans. We're heading for 500,000. This is a huge number of people. But for perspective, Alzheimer's will kill about 100 times, about 45 million Americans of the currently living Americans. So uh, as large as the pandemic is and as much as it's affecting our country, Alzheimer's is actually a substantially larger pandemic. And as far as drugs, I think, again, it's important to put that in perspective. Uh, just recently, a number of the uh, antibodies were evaluated and big, you know, big statements made, this looks really good. So first of all, let's point out, they didn't make anybody better. They didn't stop the disease from progressing. The big thing that was trumpeted was they slowed the disease progression by about one third. So as you can see, we knew, need to do much better. For people to be just continuing downhill, but a little bit slower, doesn't help us a lot. We need to be able to take people who are going downhill and now actually make them better. So the answer is there's no drug today um, that has the impact that is a sustainable improvement in symptoms. What made you write the book, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline? Yeah, it was that we had spent 30 years in the laboratory looking at what actually is Alzheimer's disease. In other words, we wanted to understand the fundamental nature of the problem, what's driving the degenerative process in enough detail that we could begin to fashion the first effective treatments. Because in fact, the area of neurodegenerative diseases has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. As they say, everyone knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. And you can say the same thing about Lou Gehrig's disease and about Huntington's disease and about Lewy body disease and frontotemporal dementia. So this is a huge, huge problem. And so after 30 years, we finally understood that in fact, Alzheimer's is much different than we had been led to believe. It's a different sort of thing. You have to treat it differently. You have to think about it differently. It really is a protective response to a set of insults, dozens and dozens of these insults. So instead of treating by giving a, a plan ahead of time and saying, okay, we're gonna treat it with this no matter what, you have to do just the opposite. You've got to flip the script and say, for each person, we're going to look at all the different potential contributors, and then we're going to target those with a personalized precision medicine protocol. And that is the 21st century medicine. That's the way of the future. And unfortunately, at Alzheimer's centers around the world, they're practicing this old fashioned kind of medicine where you decide before the person comes in, well, whatever they have, if it's Alzheimer's, we're going to give them this drug that doesn't work, which actually is, is a kind of barbaric approach. So we, I wanted to show people that, in fact, the research shows something completely different than what is currently being done, and to talk about the first people who actually got better and stayed better. We have people over nine years now who have improved, that would have been in nursing homes, that have improved, that are still working and doing very well. So I actually have another book coming out this August that's called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's Disease. And this is seven stories from people who actually were told that you've got Alzheimer's, you're going to die. And they're now back doing very, very well. And it's their personal stories. Is there more than one type of Alzheimer's? Yes. So again, we, you know, we assume this is Alzheimer's. So we say, yeah, Alzheimer's, and we don't know what causes it, and we don't have anything to treat it. But if you start delving into what is actually driving this process, which is what we want to know, we, we want to know why does each person have this degenerative process? It turns out there are dozens and dozens of things, as I mentioned earlier, 
And we usually tell the patients, imagine you have a roof with 36 holes. Well, a drug is an excellent patch for one hole, but it doesn't do a lot for the other 35. So you want it for each person, you want to measure those. Now, when we do that, what we find is that there are groups. So people who have a mostly inflammatory push toward and drive toward degenerative diseases. And you can actually trace the molecular pathways from NF kappa B, which is activated with inflammation to where the APP, the amyloid precursor protein that is critical for Alzheimer's is cleaved. And you can trace the pathway to show that when you have ongoing chronic inflammation, you drive this process that leads to the amyloid of what we call Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, that amyloid, as was shown by Professor Rudy Tanzi and Robert Moyer from Harvard, uh, is actually a protected. It is an antimicrobial peptide. So again, it's a response to an insult. So there are people that have mostly inflammatory related insults, all sorts of different pathogens, you know, Lyme disease and P. gingivalis from your mouth and herpes simplex from your lip and molds from your sinuses and things like that. Then there, then we call that type one or inflammatory or hot Alzheimer's. Then there's type two, which is atrophic. These are people that just don't have the support, hormonal support, nutritional support, and growth factor support or trophic factor support. Those things you need to keep this massive neural network going. You have over 500 trillion synapses in your brain. To keep those going, you've got to have support. If you withdraw that, you downsize. And that's type two Alzheimer's or cold or atrophic. Now, interestingly, if you have, there's a third type, which we call type 1.5 glycotoxic. And that's because it has features of both. It has features of inflammation from the non-enzymatic glycation that occurs on hundreds and hundreds of proteins. Of course, we measure this as hemoglobin A1C. Um, that's glycation of hemoglobin, but there is glycation of all sorts of things. It changes the shape. It changes the function of these proteins. And so it gives you this inflammatory response, but it also gives you an atrophic response because you become insulin resistant. So not, now you can actually measure this beautiful work by Professor Ed gets a lot of UCSF showing that you can actually see that there is insulin resistance in the neural exosomes deriving from the brain of virtually everybody with Alzheimer's disease. So that's type 1.5 or glycotoxic. Then type three is toxic and the toxins tend to come in three different types. They're inorganics, things like mercury and the more and more evidence now on air pollution as a critical uh, feature that increases risk for Alzheimer's. Second one is organic toxins, formaldehyde, toluene, benzene, benzene, glyphosate, these sorts of things. And then the third group is the biotoxins, things that are come surprisingly from things like molds. And there are special you know, molds that actually uh, cause these things like uh, stachybotrys and penicillium and aspergillus, ketomium, walemia. These are common ones that give you these toxins. So it's not all molds, but special ones that can give you this problem. That's type three or toxic. Type four is vascular. Vascular, uh, con uh, the, so it's the energetics really that are being driven by your vascular support. You need the oxygen, you need the cerebral blood flow, you need the ketones. Uh, you need the mitochondrial function. And then type five is traumatic. So where, although people do have mixtures of these, many times we see people who have some glycotoxic and some inflammatory, for example. But the bottom line here is, yes, there are different subtypes of Alzheimer's and that helps you to understand so that you know how to get best outcomes for these people. Does alcohol consumption contribute to dementia? Yes, that's a good point. And of course, alcohol consumption has been associated with dementia for years. And the one that we hear about is, is Korsakoff's uh, dementia, of course, um, where you lose the ability to consolidate new memory. And this is related to a, a B1 deficiency, but alcohol does increase uh, risk uh, modestly. Uh, and so it is a factor in Alzheimer's, but it's not one of the more common ones.